Hey there, y'all. I'm live. Prophet David Taylor here for the first live prophetic word of 2021. And I'm excited. Uh, now, wait a minute. Let me pull something up here. Pull something up here. All right. Okay, got pulled up what I wanted pulled up. All right, so I'm going to give people a few minutes to come on and let my group know. I'm going to start right at 2.30. But I've noticed that when I come on late, Y'all think that means I'm not coming? So I'm like, let me come on early. So I'll be here. I know uh, it's been several weeks. It's been over a month. I did uh, No More Beanies on Thursday. And this is the first Sunday live prophetic word. So I know it's been over a month uh, since I last did something live. So I hope everybody had a really good break. Hope you really took the time to enjoy your family. My family did uh, some Zoom chats, which was really, really a lot of fun. Really a lot of fun, really good seeing people I hadn't seen in a while, who couldn't be together in person. Really good catching up, you know, telling stories, you know, all the different kind of stuff. So really, really good. So uh, I was uh, very happy, very happy to see everyone. So I hope everybody enjoyed the same. So now we're into 2021, and uh, if you caught my No More Genies on last Thursday, you know what the Lord had to say there about that. And then if you listen to my um, prophetic locator words, prophetic locator words are where we get our grades from the Lord each year, where we get a word from the Lord um, at the end of the year and ask the Lord what he thought about our year and about 2020 and about uh just again given our grades and that scripture foundation friday is found in revelation two and three where the lord has given the grades to the churches and the lord says seven times he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the church and the lord goes through each church in asia at the time but that was not just for them that was the lord showing us the pattern as to what he does now in heaven part of his high priestly work is to look at us to church and let us know He's pleased with this or not. He's not pleased with that or we're doing something. We need to continue. We need to hold fast. We're doing a good job or we're doing something that he's not pleased with that we need to repent. We need to stop. We need to cut it out. We need to turn from that behavior and turn towards what he's pleased with. And of course, there was one church where he had no criticism. Let me pull that whole thing up so I can give you specifics. I want to give you specifics because I reference this all the time and I want you to be able to I want you to be able to look it up for yourself so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. The church that he had no criticism for was the second church and that's found in Revelation 2 and 8 and that's the church in Smyrna. Okay, the church in Smyrna. And he had not one word of criticism for the church at Smyrna, not one word, okay? Then there's, in Revelation chapter three, there's the Laodicean church, the church at Laodicea, okay? And the Lord does not have one compliment from them. He does not have one good thing to say about the church at Laodicea, not one compliment. Them Christians weren't doing anything that God was pleased with, which is a shame. This is a shame to live your whole life and never bother to ask the Lord, are you pleased with what you're seeing? Are you pleased with what I'm doing? But the church at Laodicea was doing just that. And they thought because they were financially prosperous or prosperous in the natural, that that meant they were okay with Christ and they never bothered to ask Christ because that's not true. You cannot assume that because you have money or because your career is going well, that Jesus is pleased with you or pleased with everything that you're doing because that's not what that means. 
because Christianity is a relationship. It's not a religion. It's not a set of rules. It's a person. And you have to be sure you take the time to talk to that person, to find out what he thinks about you in terms of, because we know he loves us and we know he died for us, but in what he thinks about your life choices, how you're living your life, and if you're in the will of God or not. Very, very important. And I found a lot of believers don't know that. And a lot of believers don't do that. And that's how you end up like the people in Matthew 7, where you, you done lived your whole life already. And you stand before God in judgment only to discover that you didn't even know him. Y'all didn't even have a relationship. And none of what you did counted. You you called all those, all those works before the Lord and you drug all those works before the Lord, all that stuff you did in your life. And none of it counts. Just none of it counts. So anyway, all right, so it's 2.30, 2.31. We're going to get started with today's live prophetic word, the first prophetic word of 2021, okay? So let's say a word of prayer. So thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, oh God, for your prophetic word. Thank you, oh Lord, for your faithfulness towards us. Thank you for your kindness and your love. Thank you, oh God, that you are always at a level that we can never understand, that you are always dealing with the chess pieces on the board at a level that we can never understand, oh God. And thank you that you keep it simple, that you just tell us to HBO, to hear you, believe you, and obey you, and just do our jobs. So I thank you, God, for keeping it simple. Uh, I die to myself right now, oh God, not my will, but thine be done. I must decrease so you can increase. So you speak through me, oh God, everything that you want spoken, everything that you want known, everything that you want said this day, oh God. I breathe through me right now through your precious Holy Spirit, oh God, and let your words come out. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it. And signs and wonders and miracles shall follow all that hear and believe, receive and obey the words of this prophecy. It's in Jesus' name we pray and declare and decree. Amen. Amen, amen. All right. Today's live prophetic word is, let me put it on the screen, let the old man go, okay? Today's live prophetic word is, let the old man go. Let the old man go. Now, what exactly does that mean, let the old man go? I'm glad you asked. We're going to explain it, okay? <clears throat> to let the old man go means that you fully embrace who God says you are. You fully embrace being a new preacher. Fully embrace what God says about you. And you embrace it with your whole heart. You embrace it with your whole sense of self. Okay? So let's look at the scripture. Many times, Almost every time uh, when God comes into your life or when God calls you to anything, what God does is he renames you. Sometimes he changes your proper name, like he changed Abram's name to Abraham. He changed Sarai's name to Sarah. Sometimes God will put a new crown on your head. So he took David from being David the shepherd boy and David the musician to being David the king. See what I mean? So he didn't change his name proper, but he put a new name on him or a new crown on him. Because when the Lord shows up, he always marks your life in some way. There's some type of sign that God is there. And there's some type of sign of the covenant that God has made with you. So what God wants us to do. Oh, here's my sister. Oh, my sister, I'm broadcasting live now. So what God wants us to do is fully embrace that person. Okay, let's look at it in the scripture and I'll explain it some more. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Uh, actually, actually, uh, let's look at uh, 16 and 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. I'm reading out of the Berean Study Bible. So from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Although we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let me read that in the King James Version. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
Uh, let's look at the New King James Version. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay? Now, let me hasten to say to you right here that stop trying to figure God out. Stop trying to make God's word make sense to your natural mind. Stop trying to squeeze all of God into this. You will never be able to squeeze God into this because this is not the interface that God gave you to deal with him. The interface that God gave you to deal with him was this, the breath of life inside of you, your spirit. And in your spirit lives a substance called faith, just like in your spirit lives love, in your spirit lives hope, in your spirit lives dreams. There's a lot of things because your spirit's a vessel, it's a container. That's the interface God gave you to deal with him. And that's where the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity lives inside of you, in your spirit. So stop trying to squeeze God into this. That's why so many people get in trouble with the Lord. You keep trying to reduce God to something you can understand up here. God had never asked you to see him with your natural eye, because you can't. God had never asked you to try to understand all of him with this, because you can't. God asked you to believe him. So God says that when you become saved, when you step into Jesus Christ through faith, when you become born again, you are something new. You are a new creature, a new creation. One of the translations of that phrase in the Greek, new creation, means something that the world has never seen before. So what God says is when I save you, when you get saved, when you get born again, you become something that the world has never seen before. You become something that's brand new. And that is the best news you've ever heard in your life. You become something that is unprecedented. The world's never seen it before. Then the scripture goes on to say that old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When the Bible says all things, all means all. The difference between Christians is that some Christians take that seriously and realize the full benefits of that because your body can become new. Your brain, your mind can become new. Your heart, your choices, your attitude, your friends, your everything can become new because God says that's part of the salvation package. God is saying, that's what I blessed you with when you accepted my son, Jesus, as your savior. But some Christians don't take God at his word. Some Christians try to figure it out. Some Christians try to make it make sense to this. And God's word ain't gonna never make full sense to this. Okay, so stop arguing with the maker. If he says you're something new, then you're something new. If he says old things have passed away, and all things are become new, and you're something new that the world has never seen before. He wants you to embrace that. He wants you to HBO. He wants you to hear that. He wants you to believe it. He wants you to obey it. Now, okay, I feel the Holy Spirit giving me something for 2021. So I'm either going to release that now or when I get through teaching, I'll, I'll follow the Spirit on that. But see, there's a reason. Okay, maybe I need to go into it now. There's a reason God wanted this prophetic word for 2021, because he wants us to start the year right. He does not want us to start this year dragging the things from the past into 2021 with us. He wants to take he wants us to take him at his word and leave everything that is past behind. And that's why the title of this message is Let the Old Man Go. Let the old man go, the old you, the old life, the old everything. Because all the stuff that we had prior to COVID is gone. It ain't never coming back. It ain't going to never be what it was. Whatever happens in the future, whatever new systems and structures we build going forward, they are never going to be what we had before 2020. It's gone. It's not going to happen. Okay? And so that's true on the outside world, but God wants, it, wants us to understand it's true in our lives too as Christians. That you are a new creation and you're not supposed to be dragging that old man with you. So I'm going to show you two examples in the Bible. And then I'm going to show you a promise in the Bible that you can access. Because remember, I always like to preach and teach and prophesy practically. I don't like it when people just say this pie in the sky stuff and then they don't give you any steps on what to do. So I'm going to give you two examples in the Bible. I'm going to show you somebody that got it wrong. And I'm going to show you somebody that got it right. Okay. This principle, this idea of a new creature. Okay. First, let's look at the man that got it wrong. I'm going to start out looking at Jacob. Now, Jacob is one of the patriarchs of the Old Testament, one of the founding fathers of the Hebrew faith and the Hebrew people. 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, that's what that means when it says Abraham begat Isaac. It means he had Isaac. Abraham was Isaac's father. Isaac begat Jacob. Okay, Isaac was Jacob's father, and Jacob begat all his sons and daughters. And out of all of his sons and daughters, because Jacob had four wives, all of his sons and daughters, he created the 12 tribes of Israel. And so God changed his name from Jacob. Okay, he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. The name Jacob, uh, referring to the son of Isaac, means heel catcher. It means heel catcher. Okay, why uh, did they call him a uh, heel catcher? It also, one translation means supplanter. Why did they call him heel catcher? Why did they call him supplanter? I'll tell you why. Because Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. And so both of them obviously were in the womb at the same time because they were twins. Well, Esau was the first one out. When Esau was born, when Esau came out of Rebekah, his mother, his brother Jacob had his hand on his heel, if you didn't know that. So when Jacob and Esau were born, Esau came out first, but Jacob's hand was holding his brother's heel. Okay? Can you imagine pushing a baby out and then you got one arm coming out <laughs> holding the boy's heel. That's how Jacob and Esau were born. And so they named Jacob supplanter. They named Jacob heel catcher because that's where he was born. Okay. But God renamed him Israel. Okay. And the name Israel comes from Sarah and El. El is a Hebrew word for God. It's actually probably Elohim. But uh, Sarah and El put together makes Yisrael. Sarah and El. Yisrael or Israel, as we say it in English, and that means he will rule as God. So God changed his name from supplanter and heel catcher to he will rule as God. So, and Jesus talks about that, about in the kingdom of God, Jesus sits down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the patriarchs uh, is why the Lord uh, chose his 12 followers, because he told Peter, James, and John in the 12, that they were gonna rule and reign with him over the tribes of Israel. Because Yisrael, Israel, means he will rule as God. What a blessing. What a thing for God to say in your life. What a thing for God to say. I'm going to change your name from heel catcher and supplanter because of the way you were born to someone that's going to reign and rule with me as me. Holy cow. That's who that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who Jacob was. That's the blessing that God put on him. And he renamed him Israel, the Israel. He will rule as God. And you know what Jacob did? Jacob never fully accepted it, even down to his, his deathbed. Uh, let's look at Genesis 48, chapter, chapter 48, verse 2. Genesis chapter 48, verse 2. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up in bed. One more time, when Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up in bed. That's not a play on words. That's not a typo. That's not a mistake. The Bible is letting you know there clearly that Jacob kept his old self with him all the way till his deathbed. He never, see, see, Jacob didn't understand that God appeared to him directly and God appeared to him personally. Because I know you've heard Jacob had the vision of Jacob's ladder where Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending from heaven on the ladder from heaven to earth and back and forth. It took him a long time to realize that that kind of vision and revelation don't come to everybody. And it took him a long time to realize I'm not just some dude. It took him a long time to realize that, but even after he realized it, he never fully embraced it. Because all you have to do is read his story. I don't have time to read the whole story. You can read his story and you will see that Jacob complained throughout his whole life, he whined. And you can see when he got to be older, when he was 100 years old, all he did was whine. I'm not gonna live as long as Abraham and Isaac. And, and I lost Rachel, she died in childbirth. And I lost Joseph and all this bad stuff happening in my life. And he whined, he going on and on and on about his troubles because he never let go of the old life and never said, I'm Israel. Okay, I will rule with God. I will rule as God. That's what my name means. That's the name God gave me that my son, my descendants, my posterity, my family is going to reign and rule with God. And that was the truth. 
because the Hebrews uh, were and are the chosen people. You see that? But he never embraced it. He never fully accepted it. And he whined and complained. And Jacob rehearsed his troubles all the way up until his death. So what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us through his ne negative example is not to spend your life rehearsing your troubles. Now, if you're not a whiner, that's not news to you. If you are a whiner, that means that's something you're going to have to crucify. God does not want you to start this year and God does not want you to spend all of your days on life whining and rehearsing your troubles. Now, that doesn't mean living in denial. Of course, you have to talk about something if it happens to you. And of course, it means you have to talk about it so you can get healing. Because not whining does not mean, you know, living in denial. If you had a car accident, you're not supposed to act like you didn't. If you got sick, you're not supposed to act like you didn't. But God doesn't want you to rehearse it and live in it and never let it go. OK, I personally know plenty of people who live like Jacob. Who literally up into their deathbed. Up into their deathbed, all they ever did was whine about their troubles. This happened and that happened and this one don't love me. And I didn't get the respect from this one. And this one didn't pay me no attention. And they ain't never liked me and that stuff like that. And when I was little, this happened, stuff like that. Spending your whole life whining about your troubles. Because there's not one of us that has had a trouble-free life. Not one. There's not one of us. <laughs> there's not one of us that has had a trouble-free life. But Jacob didn't get it. He didn't get that he's Israel now. He's a new creature. He does not have to keep living in what was. But he didn't get it. And you know what that cost him? He put double-mindedness into the Hebrews, into the Jewish bloodline. Why do you think when you read the Old Testament, the Jews were always so up and down with God? You ever notice that? That one minute they loved the Lord, then they didn't. And then one year they obeyed God, or then they didn't. And then they served God only. And then they wanted Baal and, and, and Dagon and, and all the phony gods. You know, you know why? It was actually because of Jacob. He put double-mindedness in the system because he didn't kill the old man. Okay? King David did that too. King David got together with Bathsheba in an adulterous relationship. Their relationship was based on lust. He lusted after another man's wife. Because he did that, lust got in his bloodline. And then most of his kids had problems with lust. One of his sons raped his daughter. Amnon raped Tamar. His son Absalom slept with all David's concubines. He slept with his father's women in front of everybody. His son, King Solomon, why? Because David didn't get rid of that lust, got with another man's wife, and brought all that lust in his bloodline. That's why God tries to tell us, don't hold on to your old self. However it is that you lived in the past, let that person go. Because I have given you the blood of Jesus, says the Lord. I've given you the broken body of Christ. I have made you, I've caused you to, to become born again. And God says, I have renamed you. Some people never get their new name from God. Some people don't even understand that spiritual principle. You're not supposed to live the rest of your life with your old name. You're supposed to live the rest of your life with your new name. Sometimes God changes your proper name, like I said, Abram to Abraham. Sometimes God puts a new crown or a new designation onto you. So whatever, I remember the day God told me I was a prophet. He said, you're a prophet, David, because I made you a prophet. You're a prophet because I said you are. That's who you are. That's not your choice is who you get to be. That's my choice. I'm the potter. I'm the one that makes people. God said, your choice is whether you're going to live up to it or not. And I'm so glad I embraced my new name. Because <laughs> I love the prophetic. Because I love what I do. I was struggling with it for a long time. But once I accepted it, once I gave into it, I love it now. I wouldn't want to be anything else. I'm so happy God made me a prophet because the maker told me that's who you are. That means it doesn't matter what I thought before. See, so I'm going to show you how to apply these principles. But right now I'm just explaining to you how it's supposed to go. And some Christians don't know you're supposed to get a new name from God, a new title, a new designation, a new crown. And some Christians do just like Jacob. They spend their whole life. Oh, this happened to me when I was 11 years old and by, and oh, and I didn't finish high school and oh, I wish I got my master's and oh, blah, 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 blah. And when you get saved, old things have passed away. 
In other words, Jesus paid for that old life, that old sinful life. The Lord paid for it. You don't have to keep living in it. And the Lord gives you a new name. And if you are a Christian looking at me right now, ask God for your, say, God, what's my new name? God, when you think of me, what do you call me? Because you have to start calling yourself that. That's why when you see on my screen, it says Prophet David Taylor. You know why I call myself Prophet David Taylor? Because God called me that. I do not care what people think. I don't care who think I'm not a prophet. I don't care who think I ain't good enough for them. Don't care. Because the Lord told me that himself. That is why you see Prophet David Taylor on the screen. Because I am embracing what the creator told me about myself. Because remember, I tell you all the time, I'm, I'm never prophesying anything to you that I'm not doing myself. You know, because I know people have a problem with spiritual leaders like that. And I had a problem with that when I was young. And I never out here telling you to do something that I'm not doing. So that's my example. You see it right there on the screen. I call me what God calls me. I don't care what people think. And I don't care who I used to be or what I used to do. That's who I am. And that's what I'm walking in because the creator said so. So what we, we want to learn from Jacob's example, and we don't want to whine and complain for the rest of our lives about our mistakes or our pain or our failures. Okay? So Jacob got it wrong. And Jacob cursed his bloodline with double-mindedness because he never let Jacob go. And King David cursed his bloodline with lust because he never let that go. So let's look at a man that got it right. Okay? One of the men in the Bible that got it right is Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is the one that wrote 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay? Now, we're going to read Philippians. Philippians is another a Pauline letter, a Pauline epistle. The word epistle is a fancy Greek word that means letter. Like you'd write an email, or like, you know, old school when we used to write letters on paper. It's a letter. It's a letter to the church at Philippi. Okay? Philippi is a city. The church at Philippi. That's why it's called Philippians. That's where that name comes from. We're going to read the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 14. Philippians, chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 14. Again, out of the Berean Study Bible. It says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. The King James Version says apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining or reaching forth towards that which is before, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of God's heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. The King James says I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. Okay, Apostle Paul was a man that got it right. How can you say, Prophet Taylor, that Apostle Paul got it right? I'll tell you why. Because Apostle Paul used to be a man named Saul. His birth name was Saul, and he was from Tarsus. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He was a professional Christian killer. Just to, to very give you a very, very, very truncated version. The Jews during the time of Christ had had a history of believing that they were justified by God according to the law, the Mosaic law. So in other words, what made a man right in the eyes of God was the keeping of the law. When Jesus came and introduced grace, Jesus said, you're not made right by God through the keeping of the law. You're made right by God through my broken body and blood and your faith in that blood. It's by grace, not by works. You don't earn it by what you do, you receive it by faith from me. That was a radical concept, okay? That was an absolutely radical concept to people that had spent their entire history believing that it's the keeping of the Mosaic law that makes us right with God. The Mosaic law was just part of the revelation. And Jesus said, I'm the full revelation. Everything that Moses taught you was just to get you to me. I'm the fullness of what God was talking about that's what the Lord was trying to explain. But that was a radical concept. So God called Saul of Tarsus to spend the rest of his life explaining that. That salvation was by grace through faith and was not something you earned. Did you know that Saul of Tarsus, that man, was a professional Christian killer? He had the papers 
from the Jewish leaders of his time to incarcerate and put to death those that were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ because it was so against what they believed. Where Jesus comes and says, salvation comes by grace through faith. It's not something you own. You don't work your way into it. That was so radical to them. And so Saul of Tarsus for a living put Christians in jail in jail, and had them killed. One day he met the Lord face to face and the Lord turned his whole life around. And the Lord said, you keep, you keep thinking that you're working against me. We're on the same team. You're supposed to be working for me. And Paul was blinded and he became, the Lord changed his name from Saul to Paul and he became an apostle. And then he wrote the majority of the New Testament. The ma vast majority of the two New Testament was written by a man that killed Christians for a living. Did you know that? The man that said he was a new creature had put to death people that believed in Jesus until he himself came face to face with Jesus and Jesus turned his life around. Did you know that? So that man, Apostle Paul, says, Some God has set this new life before me and I don't count myself. I haven't made it yet. I'm not perfected. I haven't, I haven't done all that I'm supposed to do. I'm still striving for it. But he said, this one thing I do do, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forth, I strain. I press towards what God has put in front of me so I can apprehend, so I can live my purpose, so I can do what God has called me to do in this life. That's a man that used to kill Christians for a living. And he said, I had to let that go so I can become Paul. I'm not Saul anymore. I'm not a Christian killer anymore. I'm a servant of the same Christ that I used to persecute. Now I serve him. That's a man that got it right. That's a man that didn't let his past stop him from pursuing his future. That's a man that embraced the new name that God gave him. Do you understand? That's a man in the Bible that got it right. Apostle Paul. And that is what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us as we begin 2021. Do not be carrying that old life into this new year with you. Now, I told you I was going to show you how to practically do it. Here's how you practically do it. There's a promise in the Bible that you have to apply every day. And when I say every day, I mean literally every day. That promise is 1 John 1, 9. Uh, you know what? I have not been putting the scriptures in the chat. So if you're watching me live on Facebook, I'm putting these scriptures I'm referring in the chat. So you can see them too. Two P's. One that keeps giving me the, the red dot of misspelling. Okay. Oh, through 14. Okay, these scriptures are coming in the chat. Uh, Corinthians 5 17. All the scriptures, I'm putting them down in the chat. And here's the promise scripture. The promise scripture is 1 John 1 and 9. 1 John 1 and 9 says, uh, out of the uh, King James Bible, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One more time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, what does it mean to confess? It means you have to say it out loud, you have to assent, but it also means to covenant and acknowledge. What that means in plain terms is that you're agreeing with God that sin is wrong and what you said or did was wrong. You have to do that every day. Remember I told you to keep short accounts with God? Every day when you get up in the morning and start your day, you confess your sins as part of your prayer time with God. And you tell God anything by thought, word, or deed that I have done that is sin against you, God, please forgive me. And what the Bible says is that when you do that, when you confess, when you say it out loud, and you covenant, acknowledge, agree with God, he is faithful and just. That means the Lord will always do it. And it means he's justified in doing it. Why is he justified in doing it? Because Jesus died for your sins and you don't have to pay the same bill twice. What if you went to the car dealership and you bought a car and they came back a year later and said, well, you gotta buy the whole thing again. You gotta pay for it twice. You sue them, you sue the pants off of them. Because you say, I don't have to pay for the same thing twice. Well, 
Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You don't have to pay for your sins twice. That's why God is just to forgive you because the broken body and shed blood of Christ has already uh, been, been poured out to pay for the sin. So God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now I've noticed with this verse that a lot of people spend a lot of time talking about forgiveness, but they, they don't read the whole verse. You got to read the whole verse. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? That means the forgiveness means God washes the sin off your account. The cleansing means that God washes the sin off your person. Do you understand that? So whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is that you're into, whatever it is was a part of your old life. When you confess that to God, then the record in heaven, he takes the blood of Jesus and wipes it off your account. And you're, you got a clean slate, man. You got a fresh start. Every day is a fresh start, man. You confess your sins. God wipes that slate clean. But then it goes on to say he cleanses. What that means is that he would just not wipe the slate clean. He'll take the blood of Jesus, then apply it to your spirit. And he'll wipe you. In other words, you won't want to do that anymore. You won't want to live the way you used to live. That's the promise. And then he says it cleanses from all unrighteousness, meaning there's no part of your life you can't bring before God and get made righteous. Your money, investments, uh, your schooling, your health, your nutrition practices, your relationship with your children, with your spouse, with your parents, uh, with your friends, uh, your career, your education, uh, name it. There is no part of your life that you can't bring before God to get cleansed and to get made righteous through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the best things about being a Christian is that you don't have to try to fix it. You can't fix it. You don't have to try to cleanse yourself. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't make yourself save. If it was possible for you to save yourself, there would have been no need, no need for Jesus to die and go through all that brutality if it's something we could do. You understand? So don't do like so many Christians and just keep tripping on the forgiveness. Yes, God forgives you and wipes the slate clean and wipes your record clean. But it says, and cleanse us. God will clean you from the person you used to be. Like, let's say alcohol. Let's say you just used to get lit all the time. Because some people that love liquor are lit at like 8.30 in the morning. Talking about I'm not alcohol. I'm not an alcoholic. Yes, you are. If you drink at 8.30 in the morning, yeah, you alcoholic. Sorry. If you go before God and you ask God to forgive you for your alcoholism, and then you ask God to cleanse you so you don't have to live that way anymore. Now, you might have to do that over time. It might not just all come off at once because we have to learn how to crucify the flesh. God wipes it clean, but we have to realize it in our lives. But you keep staying with God and you keep claiming his promise and you keep getting a bath under the blood of Jesus, and the day will come where you will say, I don't want to drink anymore. It might not come when you first get saved. Some people get saved and get delivered right away. Some people get saved and it takes a little bit more time. But if you keep taking a bath under the blood of Jesus, the day will come where you say, I don't want to drink no more. Because God will cleanse you. God will cleanse you. God will clean. He doesn't just cleanse your record. He cleanses you. And then it says, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means you can bring anything to him. Any part of your life that's not straight, you can bring it to him and he'll make it righteous. What a promise. Now, do you see why it's foolish for us as Christians not to know the word? Can you see now why it's foolish for us as believers not to take advantage of everything God has given us? Can you see it? All right. So that's the prophetic word for today, that we got to let the old man go. We got a promise from God that we can apply every day, 1 John 1 and 9. We got our new status, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We got our new mindset, Philippians 3, 12 through 14, forgetting those things which are behind. And we got a promise to activate every day, 1 John 1 and 9, that I can take a bath under Jesus' blood and I don't have to walk in that what I used to walk in. And I can not do like Jacob and keep rehearsing the old life until I die, but do like Apostle Paul and embrace the new life and let the old man go. Good God Almighty. What a promise. What a savior. What a mighty word. All right. Let me see if the Holy Ghost has anything else he wants me to say.
All right. I just heard cleansing in my spirit. So just an echoing a repeat of what we just got. Okay. Now, remember I told you at the beginning of this year, my goal is to increase my reach. I want to increase the reach of my prophetic ministry. And the reason I want to do that is because whenever a prophetic word comes forth from the Holy Spirit, as many Christians as possible need to hear it. Okay. So yeah, my sister said she's a living testimony. Amen. She got cleansed. She said she hadn't smoked in 38 years. What a blessing. Amen. And praise God. So every video that I do, I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me. Okay. Because I cannot increase my reach by myself. So I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me. So the thing I'm going to ask you to help me do is I'm going to ask you to check out and get my daily prophetic devotional. Now I, I'm putting the link in the chat box. Uh, my daily prophetic devotional. Now, what my prophetic devotional is, is, uh, wait, let me see. Maybe that link was it. All right, wait a minute. I'm going to put a better link. Here we go. Uh, what my prophetic devotional is, is this a way for you to develop your own prophetic walk with God? Because you need your own prophetic. You need your own prophetic walk with God. You need your own prophetic walk with God. Too many people are, are not developing themselves in their own prophetic walk with God. And that is a mistake because the day is going to come where you're going to need to get a prophetic word from the Lord for yourself. And to do that, you need to have developed your own prophetic walk with God. Okay. And so I designed my daily prophetic devotional for that purpose so that uh, you can learn how to meditate on a scripture every day. And I'm going to make some videos demonstrating this if, if you don't, you're not quite sure how to do it. So you can meditate on a scripture every day so you can get revelation about that scripture from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can show you how to prophetically apply that scripture to your life. It's written, my book is constructed journal style. So that, as a matter of fact, let me put that on the screen. Constructed journal style so that you can write down every day the revelations you get from the Holy Spirit and then come back later and see when that, that prophetic word has come to pass. Okay? So I have one that covers the entire year. I have one per quarter. So right now, the one to, to get is the quarter one which uh, covers January, February, and March. So I put the link in the chat. I'm going to ask you to check that out and pick that up and let some other people know that are interested in getting their prophetic walk with God going to check out that devotional because that's a way for you to study a scripture. Every scripture in that book has been prayed over. And I asked the Holy Spirit, what scripture do you want on this day? And every scripture there is this, it comes from a prophet or it's about something prophetic. And so you can you can begin to get an understanding of what the prophetic is and what is not and how it works and how the Holy Spirit wants to apply it to your life. That's what my daily prophetic devotional is about. So the one thing I'm going to ask you to do for me to help increase my reach in this video is go check that out, pick that up and let as many people know as you can that are interested in getting their own prophetic walk with God going. OK, uh, there's two kinds. There's one with a writing page and the other without a writing page. A writing page just means you have a page behind the scripture page, so you can write notes on it. And the writing page means that you don't. All of the pages are just back to back. So you can get whichever one you want. Uh, I do believe the one with the writing page is like $12.99, I believe, and the one without the writing page is like $9.99. So they're not expensive. So you can, I did that on purpose because I want as many people as possible to get one, okay? So pick up that daily uh, prophetic devotional and let as many people know about it as you can. That's the one thing I want you to do from this video to help me increase my reach in 2021. Okay. All right. Amen. And God bless. Do you have any prayer requests? If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Put them on the screen now and I'll pray for them. Uh, if you don't have any prayer requests, I'm going to go ahead. I want to sign off. Thank you so much for listening to me live. Those of you that have watched me live. God bless you, and thank you so, so much to those of you that are listening to me on the replay. Remember to go back to the very beginning of the video and listen to the whole video from the top. 
don't skip a section because there's things you need to know all the way through. Okay? All right. I don't see any prayer requests. I'm going to get on and sign off. Thank you so much. Remember to remember the words that the Holy Spirit said that we're cleansed, we're new creatures, and we're not supposed to go into 2021 carrying the old man, but it's time to let the old man go. Oh, my sister said, pray for me. Pray for you what specifically, sis? Uh, be specific. When we pray, we always have to target something specific with God. We can't just, uh, just you know, throw up general blanket prayers. You got to say something specific. What do you want? So uh, let me know that. But yeah, so I'm excited. You know, when I hear these prophetic words, when the Holy Spirit gives them to me, I'm excited. It ministers to me just like it does to you. I'm excited about 2021. I'm excited about going forward. I'm excited about, you know, mentally and emotionally uh, just leaving uh, all the old stuff in the past and going forward. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift my sister up to you, Lord. I lift her life up to you, O oh God, that you would show her in the area, O oh God, that she is not submitted or surrendered to you and show her how to not just accept you as Savior, but accept you as Lord and to listen to what you're saying to her on a daily basis, follow your voice and follow the scriptures. So she can build and have the life that you died to give her. And I pray that blessing over her right now. In Jesus' name, we declare and decree it. Amen. Amen and amen. All right, that's it for this week. I will be back next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. All right, God bless. Have a great week. And remember, it's time to let the old man go. <laughs>